Kieran Patrick Kelly was born on the 16th of March 1930 to parents Martin Kelly and Annie Kelly. He was the first child of three, having two younger siblings, a sister and a brother. The children were all born in Rathdowney, County Leash, a small town south of Dublin in Ireland, and were all baptised into the Catholic Church. In 1937, the Kelly family apparently moved very quickly to a small house in Dublin. As devout Catholics, they attended church regularly, with all the children receiving their confirmation. Kieran had a fairly normal life growing up in Dublin, but on leaving school, a young Kieran found it difficult to find work. Available jobs were primarily labouring jobs, and for a man of Kelly's stature, being small and thin, he was passed over for the more robust of men. Apparently, some of Kelly's relatives in the past had joined the British Army, so at age 18, he decided to follow in their footsteps and did the same. In 1951, for some unknown reason, Kelly deserted. He went AWOL. It was a year before he was caught in Dublin and then discharged from the army. He found work doing light labouring jobs, but he also started stealing and was arrested on three different occasions, ending up in prison more than once, serving in total at least four years and nine months. After his arrests, he drifted from job to job, doing light labouring work. He also continued with his life of petty crime. At the age of 30 in 1960, Kelly left Dublin for London, leaving his family behind. He wouldn't see them again and he apparently never returned to Ireland. Where would he go now in the big city of London? Because of a previous visit, he knew the areas of Tootin and Camberwell Green, so he headed there. While in Camberwell, Kelly in 1961 apparently married an Irish woman who already had five children of her own. The family grew as Kelly fathered two more. By 1964, the marriage was over and Kelly's life went back downhill. Making acquaintances along the way, he couch surfed for a time and joined other Irish men who had also gone to the big city looking for work. He moved from place to place, staying in Brixton, Clapham and Camberwell, always moving, looking around to find work. Kelly's life spiralled into drugs and alcohol. He wandered the streets, living rough. His mental state plummeted. He became well known in the homeless community and enjoyed his newfound popularity. He often stole from shops and shared his pilfered items with his companions. Although there was monetary help through social security, the small amount they received didn't help much towards their needs. After paying for a warm bed for the night, the shoplifting helped supplement the need for food and in some cases their addictions. Living on the streets was hard. Kelly moved around a lot, often making good use of a couple of hostels in the areas he frequented. He became well known to the police as he was caught on many occasions, usually for theft. The London Underground became a comfortable spot for Kelly as he found he could keep warm in the stations. The Underground stations were not as well policed as they are now and the lack of restrictions meant people could get away with quite a lot. SEX was readily available and he apparently made the most of it. Kelly's long list of offences saw him doing more and more time in prison. His offences included vagrancy, drunk and disorderly, to more serious crimes such as armed robbery. He was eventually sent to Broadmoor, as his mental health was seen to be unstable when he and another man broke into a home and threatened a woman at knife point before robbing her home. In 1971, after two years, he was released. Kelly managed to find some labouring work and would at times manage to get himself a warm bed with different women he had charmed. And like many, they found him fun to be with until he lost his temper. Before his arrest for murder, Kelly spent years in and out of prison, becoming a regular face around the London prisons. It wasn't until his arrest in 1983 for petty theft that Kelly's true nature emerged. When, while in Clapham Common Police cell, he and another man were placed in a cell with William Boyd, who was sleeping off a heavy night of drinking. 
Kelly strangled William Boyd to death with his socks that he tied together. When asked why he did it, he responded that he snored too loud. Later, Kelly sat in front of two police officers and made some astonishing claims in a taped interview. The detective, Detective Inspector Ian Brown, sat opposite Kelly and recalled how odd Kelly acted that day. The small, skinny man was very excited, almost manic. While looking through Kelly's records, the detective noted that in 1977, Kelly had been arrested for the murder of Ed Toll, another homeless man who had been found dead in a Kennington Park churchyard. It was said at a later date that Kelly had used his belt to strangle the man after he found him sleeping in the spot he liked to sleep. There were two witnesses to this, but due to them both being alcoholic drug users, their evidence was not deemed credible. Kelly, who had claimed innocence of the crime, was acquitted of this at the Old Bailey after the jury found there was little to no evidence to convict him. Knowing of this crime, Detective Brown then asked Kelly if he wanted to tell him about any other murders. Expecting Kelly to deny any others, apart from the Boyd killing, the detective thought he might confess to the Kennington Park murder, but Kelly went on to ask which murder they wanted to know about. He then mentioned the name Fisher. Is that the one you want to know about? he asked. Sure, the detective realising he was onto something here, responded. Tell me more. After searching the records, an officer returned with an unsolved murder of a man called Hector Fisher, an alcoholic. Although he sometimes slept rough, he wasn't homeless. He was found stabbed to death behind a church on Clapham Common in 1975. On questioning Kelly, they heard his description of the murder, giving some very clear and precise details that only the killer would know. He mentioned taking money from 62-year-old Fisher's pockets, but left £40, so it wouldn't look like robbery. Kelly claimed to be drunk at the time, so some things were a bit vague, but he knew he had hit him over the head with something heavy, and he'd cut him. When asked why he killed him, Kelly replied, because he was a dirty old C-U-N-T. Claiming to be smarter than the police, he had disposed of the knife in the bins, as he knew the rubbish was due to be collected. The next day, Kelly was stopped twice by uniformed police, outside the area Fisher had been found. On checking his name, later, they pulled him in for questioning. Kelly denied knowing anything. After some time, the officer asked Kelly when all this had started. Kelly went on to say 1953, the year of the young Queen's coronation, where he and his friend went to London for this occasion. While down in Baker Street tube station, he and his friend Christy Smith, who he apparently reconnected with while back in Dublin after being discharged from the army. Kelly claimed that after drinking heavily, they had an argument and Kelly pushed him under a train. And that was, according to Kelly, the start of it all. The police were trying hard to keep up with Kelly's ramblings. He continued to talk of other murders, claiming that after getting away with the first murder and then another, he found he couldn't stop. Although it played on his mind, he just continued. So now, having been caught back to rights, he decided he would come clean about all the others he had committed. Kelly went on to tell of other murders all over London. Given the names of the victims, he told them how, where and when he had committed their murders. The police struggled to keep up with this seemingly endless confession. Kelly claimed Mickey Dunn was poisoned with surgical spirits and pills they stole from a chemist. They crushed up and fed them to him as a drink. Kelly would later say he wanted to kill him. He wanted to kill him slowly. It would be discovered that Dawn had testified against Kelly at the Tall trial, making revenge the motive for Kelly to kill him. But Mickey Dunn checked into a hospital when he began feeling very sick and complained of stomach pains. A few days later, he died. But death was recorded as bronchial pneumonia and cirrhosis of the liver, and an expert would later state they would not put Dunn's death down to poison him with the spirits and pills. Scotch Jack, Kelly claimed, was beaten to death. 
Kelly hit him over the head with an iron bar. He was found in a house basement in Clapham. Kelly would admit to always killing in a brutally violent way and he always did it on purpose. Although he was often drunk, he knew what he was doing and he knew he wanted them to die. He claimed to have killed one vagrant by forcing him to drink a whole bottle of whiskey. He held his mouth open while tipping his head back and pouring the liquid into his mouth. He claimed to push another man under a train at Kennington Underground. It would be discovered that Kelly had been acquitted of the attempted murder of Francis Taylor. It was alleged Kelly pushed onto the train lines at Tooting Beck Station in 1982. Apparently there was no mistaking it was Kelly that pushed him as there were plenty of viable witnesses and thankfully Taylor survived. The list went on with Kelly, apparently wanted to make sure the murders were claimed as his and only his. He seemed pleased to see he had the police running around in circles, claiming he would be smiling as he goes to court. There's something hauntingly cold about the look that must have been on the skinny, dishevelled man's face, with his distinct large nose that gave him the nickname Nosy Kelly. As comedic as that sounds, to me it's terrifying that this man apparently wandered almost invisible around London, just killing people. Kelly picked his victims from the homeless community. They were vulnerable and an easy prey for him. Their addictions were their disadvantage. They were subdued and couldn't fight back, making it easy for Kelly to attack. He was asked to name all those he had murdered, and he happily reeled off the names he could remember. The need to confess his crime seemed to ease his mind. Christy Smith being the first, 1953, but no trace of this person could be found in London, and no bodies on the train line had been reported in 1953. But years later, after some amazing investigative work by dedicated Irish journalist, a Christy Smith was found, but what happened to him, nobody knows. 1973 was Scotch Jack. Also, a Bournemouth man and a man in Shepherd's Bush. He didn't know who they were, but he claimed to have stabbed the man in Bournemouth to death and kicked the Shepherd's Bush man to death. Hector Fisher was 1975, although there would be some doubts due to Kelly's confusing answers on tape when he confessed. 1976, he forced a man to drink spirits. In 1977, he was acquitted of Edward Toll's murder. In 1982, he was acquitted of attempted murder for Francis Taylor. Also in 1982, Mickey Dunn, but they don't think Kelly poisoned him, even if he had tried to. Also around 1982, alcohol poison and arson, but Kelly was confused about this, as he claimed it to be his, but it might not have been him, as Kelly, it was discovered, was in prison at the time, but Kelly was adamant he'd killed someone. 1983 was the attempted murder of Jock Gordon, and the case was dropped. Homeless man Jock Gordon was pushed onto the train tracks after a fight with Kelly and he survived. He dropped the charges as Kelly was his friend. 1983 was also William Boyd. It would take the police two weeks to get all the information out of Kelly and it was confusing. The list finally stopped in the double figures, at least 13 to 15 murders. Kieran and Kelly, if all he claimed were true, could be one of the most prolific serial killers in British and Ireland's history at that time. Kelly was tried and convicted in 1984 of just the two murders, William Boyd's and Hector Fisher's, the police apparently stating that they couldn't prove completely his other confessed murders, nor was there any evidence so he was only tried for the ones that they could prove. He served his life sentence at HMP Frankland in Durham before passing away aged 71 in 2001. So why is he hardly ever talked about? Why is he not very well known in true crime? In 2015, Karen Kelly's crimes became front page news when a book was released claiming there had been a cover-up of Kelly's crimes. 
If it had been, people wanted to know the truth. What and why was this covered up? Retired Detective Inspector Ian Brown, who had originally interviewed Kelly, gave the confessed murder count as between 13 to 15. Now the new figure, according to the book, was 30 or more. In the book, he claimed as a young police officer, he sat in on some of the interviews before later getting to know Kelly on a more personal level. And it was his claim in his book that had highlighted Kelly's cases once again. Apparently, according to the author of the book, in 1983, this young trainee police officer was tasked with looking into all of Kelly's claims and he allegedly gathered information from witnesses to prove unaliving themselves while Kelly was with them. But allegedly his findings just vanished. He claimed that Kelly had confessed to him about other murders where he had pushed victims under trains in tube stations. He also claimed that the Home Office at the time had put pressure on the Met Police to keep the information about the murders under wraps to stop the public mass panic and disapproval for letting Kelly get away with multiple murders for so long. Because of these claims and the outpouring of anger from the public after the story was released, the Home Secretary made the decision to investigate these claims. The claim was taken very seriously and although the police denied this couldn't have possibly happened because of those particular reasons, it was looked into. Was a scandal about to emerge against the police's handling of a case from the 1970s and 80s? A journalist and producer decided to look into this story of a man he'd never heard of. He found it odd that an Irish serial killer on the loose in London hadn't been picked up on before in the tight-knit Irish community, even in the church. They hadn't heard of anything, so the cover-up could be real. After some lengthy discussions on the case and some investigative work, there were questions needing to be answered regarding the claims made in the book. He spoke to those involved in the Kelly case, including his solicitor at the time. They went to the very man who worked on the Kelly case. In fact, he was one of the two who made the interview tapes. Detective Inspector Ian Brown, who had never spoken about the case publicly and didn't expect to be talking about it years later, he vaguely recalls an apprentice detective who escorted Kelly to and from the courts but was never present when the two senior detectives interviewed Kelly. The apprentice detective did receive a commendation for his legwork on the Kelly case but Detective Inspector Ian Brown stated that the claims of more than 30 plus murders made by the apprentice detective in his book were unfounded. The story of Kerr and Kelly being an underground train station killer was greatly exaggerated, as was the murder count of 31. In Ian Brown's own words, the latest news on Kelly was just fantasy. Kelly did admit to pushing some men onto train tracks, but only one died. So why were all these murders unheard of? Why was Kelly almost ignored after all he was classed as a serial killer? The answer could lie in the tapes from 1983. There was a lot of confusion from Kelly. His mind seemed to be all over the place. Over the years, the alcohol had ravaged his mind. He struggled to remember many things. And the things he professed to have done couldn't be positively proven, except the two he'd been convicted of. He would claim one thing one day and be unsure of it the next. But Ian Brown states that he believes Kelly had killed at least 15 people over the years, although his rigorous and intense investigations into the other murders unfortunately didn't produce the results and evidence he would have liked for him to be able to build a case, he remained positive that Kelly was a serial killer. Just to add a little more mystery to this astonishing story, back in Rath Downey at Kelly's former home, the new owner began building at the property Kelly lived in with his family before moving to Dublin. It was now 1984 and while digging he came across what he believed to be a human skull and some other bones. A thick wire noose was found around the neck of the skull. The local police were called and it was thought to be a donkey's remains. 
but a doctor who was present with the police thought it may be a human skull. The men who found the bones thought it odd when they asked at a later time they were told it was an animal, but they also found a small shoe with the remains. The men would also remember Kelly's sister bringing her mother back to the house a couple of times. They didn't stay long before they left again. When there was further inquiries years later, a report of the incident couldn't be found because they were told if the bones were found to be animal bones, a report wouldn't be made and the case wasn't deemed as suspicious. A guard who was there at the time said the bones were sent for analysis but no report came back and no further action was taken. The evidence from that day no longer exists. So we're still left guessing and in the words of retired Detective Inspector Ian Brown, Kelly will always be a mystery. Thank you for listening.